We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, Arundel Christian Church. Great to see you all. I would love to ask you to do me a favor. I'm, I'm going to assume that every one of us, if I asked you to think of something that you brought into this room, not something physical, just something heavy, something that you're dealing with, something you're struggling through right now, maybe it's something you're worried about, anxious about, sad about, whatever. And uh, I want to just give that over to God so that we can go into this opening of God's word free of that distraction. So think of that thing. Everybody got their thing? Maybe you're like, I got like eight things. That's fine. Grab all eight of those things. Just open up your hands like this and let's pray. God, would you take the burden that we're carrying right now? Would you take that thing that we brought in here with us that's distracting our mind right now? And in the name of Jesus, would you let us just have the strength to set that down at your feet right now? Please let us give that over to you so our eyes and our ears and our hearts can be open to the the teaching that you want to show each of us from your word. We love you and we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house with brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are in the fourth week going through the book of Colossians together. And uh, today, uh, we're gonna continue in that series, week four out of 12. So we got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, real quick to c- give you a, an overview of what you might have missed Uh, On week one, we talked about Colossians is actually a letter written from a guy named Paul to a church that he helped to plant called Colossae. And so we we saw that. And week two, we talked about the truth that the gospel, uh, that that evangelism is an endurance sport. It's not a one-time thing where you share your faith with someone and then you run off, right? It's uh, the process of discipleship and repeating that process. It's an endurance sport. And last week, Pastor Michael walked us through a prayer that Paul had for the people of Colossae, right? He was praying simply for them in three different ways. He was praying for them to have wisdom. He was praying for them to be obedient. And he was praying for moral excellence, that they would be uh, uh, excellent in in pursuing what God had for them. And so uh, thinking of those three things and how really you can see how much Paul cares for this church to pray that over them. This past week has been week number one of my wife and I having sent our oldest daughter to college. She's in another state, right? She, she's not sleeping in her bedroom, you know, for a week now, and it's tough. But I think about, like, what is our prayer for her as she's thriving, as she's moving into what God has next for her? And it would be a prayer like this, right? We're praying for her to have wisdom, We're praying for her to be obedient to what God's calling her to do, and we're praying for her to excel with excellence in whatever God's called her to. And so you can see just the way we we want that for our daughter, Paul really feels like a father to this church. He was probably never actually even visited Colossae. He sent people to plant the church, but he, he still has that fatherly love for them, and he's praying for them. And we saw that last week, those three things that he was praying for them. Now today, we're going to look at Colossians 1, verses 13 through 20. So if you have a copy of God's Word, open it up to Colossians 1, 13 to 20. If you don't own a copy of God's Word, we're going to fix that right now. Just grab a Bible from the chair in front of you, write your name on the top of it, and take that home with you, okay? So Colossians is in the New Testament, so uh, basically uh, three quarters of the way through the Bible, you'll find the New Testament, and you'll if you keep flipping, you'll find a a short four-chapter letter called Colossians. We're going to look at 1, 13 through 20 together. Now, let me give you an idea of what's going to happen in these verses. So Paul's all done with kind of the introductory stuff. Hey, here's who I am. Here's who you are. I'm praying for you guys. I'm so glad and thankful for the gospel and how it worked in your life. That part of the the first chapter is over. And now what he's moving into is really... Uh, an exhortation. He's challenging them by something that that we all need to be challenged with here. You see, what's happening is this church called Colossae, they were a brand new church. 
They were really young. They were just, most of these people had just recently given their lives to Jesus. And in doing so, they're so excited about their new faith. They're so excited about what they're learning that anybody who comes and claims to have authority, they're believing everything they hear. And, and some of the things they're hearing aren't actually true. Yeah, you know, I was thinking, uh, you know, there's a, you guys have heard of Webster's Dictionary, right? You know, Webster's Dictionary, they have uh, words that they add to the dictionary every year because we, we use them enough and they're like, oh, I guess this is a word now. Let's add it to the dictionary. And so, but do you know that they also, when they add a word, they also go in and find words that we never use anymore and they subtract, they take words away. One of the words for 2024 that they removed from the dictionary because apparently we don't use it anymore is the word gullible, which I think is pretty interesting because I use that word. Or some of you like, how many of you use that word? And you're like, why would they? Yeah, they didn't take word the way they didn't take away the word gullible from the dictionary. I'm just messing with you right now, okay? How many of you believe me? You're thinking that's weird. <laughs> See, here's here's the problem for a lot of us. You're like, well, there's a pastor on stage. He wouldn't possibly lie to us. And so I made up a story about them removing the word gullible to prove that for a lot of us, we're, we're quite gullible. When people say something to us, we're like, I, I guess they took the word gullible out of the dictionary. <laughs> and so Paul's talking to a church that because they're young and they're excited and they're hungry and they're thirsty, they're believing every little wind of doctrine that walks into the church. Somebody says, hey, I want to tell you something, that you need Jesus, and you need to worship Michael the archangel too. And hey, you should, you need Jesus, but you also got to follow the law. Hey, you need Jesus, but make sure you also do everything this guy says. And, and so a lot of people are walking into this young church, and they're teaching stuff that isn't real and isn't true. And that, that's a warning for you. Just because a pastor gets on, on stage and says something, you got you to gotta do some work and, and check it out for yourselves, right? And so that's essentially what we're going to look at from verses 13 to 20. He opens up this idea about a, a heresy that they're experiencing within the church. And as simply put, it's this idea that Jesus isn't enough. That you need Jesus, yes, but you got to add something to Jesus. And that's what's kind of working its way through this church and Paul hears about it, and now in 13 to 20, he's going to address this idea that, listen, Jesus alone is enough. You don't need Jesus plus anything else. And so in these verses, we're going to see four ways, I believe, that he's communicating that Jesus alone takes care of something that we've got. I want you to think about this. Jesus alone, this concept of Jesus plus nothing. If you were going to be stranded on an island for a month, and I told you, hey, the, just you, but I'm going to let you take one thing with you. Just you, and, and, and oh, you get one thing alone, just one thing. What is it that you would bring? I don't know. Think about that, right? We all probably come up with something different. We'd all have, some of us would be really creative, and we're like, I'd bring a, you know, a wish for, you know, I don't know. I'd, I don't know what the, I'd bring a, a rescue boat, right? I'd bring, I don't well, what's the one thing you would bring? I, I was thinking about this as an exercise this week in writing. And I know what a lot of you are thinking you're supposed to say. You're like, I think I'm supposed to say the Bible. Is that what you're thinking? Uh, I think if you were going to be stranded, I would, I personally, I would rely on the scripture I've memorized. I'm like, All right, God, thank you for letting me memorize scripture because right now I'm going to need some food, right? I'm going to need some, I, I need something. And I would bring like a, 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 bee colony hive, a honey bee hive. So I just have like an endless supply of honey. You know, honey is actually very nutrient. You can survive off of honey for a very long time. You eventually will need other things, but for a month you can get by just on honey. You know that? Well, I don't know what you'd bring, but here's, here's the idea. Jesus, in, in the grand scheme of survival in, the, in eternity, is the one thing that alone is sufficient. And so Paul's trying to express this in these verses. So let's look at this together. Your very first fill in the blank this morning is that Jesus alone saves. Nothing else in this world, no thing, no person has the capability to save you 
from yourself. Nothing does. Jesus alone saves. We see this in 13 and 14 where it says this, for he, this is, uh, this he is God, for God the Father has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and he has transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, that's Jesus, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Let's look at that again. It says, for, for God the Father, he rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Now think about, um, you know that, that moment where you go to see a matinee, go to the theater during the daytime, and you're in like this dark theater for like two and a half hours, and then you walk out and they open up the doors and like the sun just whoo, hits you. You're like, ooh, where are my sunglasses, right? Because you've been in this dark theater for so long. Well, I picture this kind of juxtaposition, right? You, according to this verse, on your own, you are stuck in this kingdom of darkness. All of us, because of our sin, because of a, a problem we inherited from our ancestors, we are, we are stuck in this kingdom of darkness. And according to Scripture, Jesus alone is the one who can save you out of that darkness and bring you into the kingdom of light. First John actually says that God is light. You get to be saved from darkness and into a relationship with God. It's amazing. You know, that, that concept of a kingdom of darkness, we're not just talking about a supernatural kingdom of darkness we call hell. Does Jesus save you, uh, those who place their faith in him, does he save you from hell? Yes, he does, but I want you to know that, that the scripture actually says that Satan is, is often called the prince of this world. That he has been given authority, certain authority, anything within the realms that God has allowed to have authority over this world. And this world is a really dark and twisted place. Jesus has the ability to save you from the, the, the junk that we find ourselves in. To save us, not only supernaturally for eternity, but even just to save you from the, the world and, and brokenness around you. I want to um, zoom in on three words in this verse. One of the words is the word rescue. Do you see that one? Fourth word there, for he has rescued us. This, this word in the Greek is the word reyume. This word rescued, it's, it's reyume. And reyume is used other places in scripture. And, and in one, one of the places that it's used is Paul is talking about how God reyume, that rescued him from a lion's mouth. So this is like a really legitimate understanding of the word rescue. When you picture yourself, if you were in the mouth of a lion and someone came up and, I don't know, shot the lion or opened up the lion's mouth or wrestled it to the ground and got you out of its, its you know, mouth, you would in that moment understand what it means to be saved, to be rescued. And the truth is that Jesus is the only one strong enough to open up the mouth of this lion. The only one to save you from the problem that you have. Jesus rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. Very literal rescue. You have been saved if you're, if you're part of the family of Christ. Another word I want to look at in this verse is the word transferred. You really think about it. We were all born into, if you, if you were born, if you're in this room and you were born in the United States, right, you were born and you got a birth certificate, you became a, a citizen of the United States of America. Well, all of us in this room, we all were born in our sin nature. We were all born citizens of the world. We were born in darkness. We were citizens not of, of, of God, but of, of the world. And this verse says that Jesus alone has the ability to, to not only rescue you from the lion's mouth, but to then give you a brand new citizenship. You, you say, listen, I don't want to be a citizen of the world anymore. I want to take that citizenship. I want to expatriate, and I want to now become a citizen of heaven. I want to be a citizen of, of, of God. I want to be part of his family. One of my favorite stories of all time is, is Les Mis. Anybody familiar with the story of Les Mis? Anyone else really like the story? But one of my favorite parts in the story is the main character... He's a guy named Jean Valjean. 
In John Valjean, uh, he gives, he, he makes a promise to a dying woman. She's dying, and she asks John Valjean, would you please find my daughter? She's in a really bad situation. Will you rescue her? Right? And so Jean Valjean goes and he finds this little girl named Cosette and he rescues her out of this really dark situation that she's in and finds her. And what he could have done in that moment, right, is say, okay, you're rescued now, Cosette. Now, good luck, right? I hope you can make it. You're not in that situation anymore, but uh, here's a few bucks, you know, try to make your way. But that's not what he does. He doesn't just rescue her. What, what does he do? He takes Cosette and he adopts her into his family. And says, I'm now going to be your papa. I'm going to be your father. And he raises her as his own. That's the kind of saving that Jesus does for you. Not only does he rescue you from darkness, but then he transfers you into his family line and says, you are now one of my children. You're now part of my family. And so you get rescued and you get transferred. Another word I want to look at here is the word purchased. It says here in the, in the verse that, that Jesus who purchased your freedom. Think about this for a moment. Have you ever seen one of those paintings like hanging on a wall somewhere that it looks like somebody just took a paintbrush and they dipped it into a random color of paint and they just went and went... And they just did that for a couple seconds. And then you find out that someone pays $100,000 for the thing. You're like, what in the world? How do you determine that that painting is worth $100,000? And some other painting that I like a whole lot more, like the, the artist is incredible, but nobody will ever buy their stuff. Like, how do you determine which painting is more valuable? You guys know the, the answer? Guess what? A painting is worth whatever someone is willing to pay for it. If you make the most incredible painting in the world, the most talented painter, but nobody's willing to buy it, your painting is worthless. It might be special to you and your mommy, but it's not special to anybody else. And at the same time, if somebody goes and slaps some stuff on the wall and there's some billionaire who says, I want that in my house, I'm willing to pay whatever it takes, then it's a very valuable painting. And at the end of the day, what we learn from this is we know how valuable we are because of what price we were purchased. Our freedom was purchased. And what does it cost? The scripture is going to tell us in this passage that Jesus paid for us with his own blood. You, my friend, my brothers and sisters, and those of you in this room who aren't yet brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to know you are incredibly valuable, so valuable, that God sent his only son to die on the cross to save you so he could purchase you and, and adopt you and save you into his family. Jesus alone saves. It says in Romans 10, verse 9, if, everyone say the word if. And that's such an important word in this verse. Because I, I don't want anyone walking away thinking, all right, Jesus saved me. No, there's an if. It says if. You openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is an if-then statement. If you believe in your heart and you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, then you get saved, reumade. You get, you get uh, transferred in citizenship from the world into the kingdom of light purchased by the blood of Jesus. Jesus alone saves. Here's the second one. Write these down in your notes. Jesus alone shapes. Now, all these are going to start with S because that's what pastors do, all right? <laughs> Jesus alone shapes. Let's look at that in Colossians 1, verses 15 and 16. It says, Christ is the visible image of of the invisible God. Let's pause right there for just a moment. I know you want to keep reading, but think about this for a moment. It says that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Did anybody else know anything else, anyone else that was created in the image of God? Scripture says that you were made in the image of God. Now, that doesn't mean that, that you're the same as Jesus. You see, Jesus is in the image of God, but has always existed, was never created. Jesus always has been. 
And so that's going to be an important truth. You also were at some point created. You were made at some point. You had to start in the image of God. But Jesus has always existed as the visible image of the invisible God. And it says this, he existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He created everything supernatural and everything natural. It says he made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. That last sentence right there on the screen, everything was created through him and for him. This has a pretty interesting implication. What this verse tells me is that if God created everything, even stuff in the supernatural realm, he created it through him and for him, that means God created Satan. And not only did God create Satan, but God created Satan as part of his ultimate plan to fulfill his purposes, because everything was created by God and for his purposes. And so even Satan was created by God to ultimately fulfill God's purposes, which is interesting to think about. So let's think about this idea that Jesus alone shapes. Why is this world round? Right? Because God shaped it. He decided that the world's round. Why is uh, a redwood tree tall? You know, well, God designed it that way. He created it and he shaped it and decided it was going to be tall. Right? Why are my abs so chiseled? <laughs> you guys aren't that gullible? No? Okay. Bummer. All right. All uh, right. Why, why are things the way they are? Because God shapes them that way. That's the way God makes it. And God created all things. He puts his hand on everything is the way, and, and God formed it to be the way he wanted it to be. Now, certainly sin enters the world. Sin enters the picture. Satan tries to distort what God has made and starts to mess things up. But before any of that happened, everything that was made was made exactly the way God wanted it to be. He shaped all things. Now, let's think about this for a moment. Let's make this personal. Right now, we're thinking about God shaping and creating things, and you're thinking of other things. But do you know that God also created and shaped you? God made you. He formed you, according to Scripture, in your mother's womb. He knit you together. Ephesians says that you're a masterpiece. We'll read that in just a moment. But I, here's, here's what I want you to think about. This word shape, it's a really cool acronym we're going to put up on the screen. We'll pop all of them up there at once, all right? This, this acronym SHAPE, in this room, if you've given your life to Jesus, one of the things that happens when you give your life to Christ is you receive a gift called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brings gifts with, with him, and, and you receive some spiritual gifts. You receive gifts that you can use to fulfill the Great Commission, that you can use to take the, world, uh, the word out to the world. And so all of us in this room that are brothers and sisters in Christ, you have unique spiritual gifting. All of us have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Some of us have none of this and a lot of that. Some of us have a lot. We all have a different makeup of spiritual gifts. But all of us, if you're a brother or sister in Christ, you have spiritual gifts. They're different than mine, but you have them, all right? And then heart, H, reminds us that we all are passionate about different things. Some of us in this room, like you'll tell a story and you're, you'll be telling the story and you'll be crying and you'll be looking at everyone else and like, why is nobody else crying right now? Like, well, they're just not as passionate about the thing is that you're talking about, but they are, they're passionate about other things. They have their own passions, things that really get the, their heart stirred, right? And then this uh, word abilities, A, A for abilities. All of us in this room, we have different strengths. We have different things that we're good at. Aren't you so thankful that we have a team that can stand up here every Sunday and they lift up uh, their voices for us and lead us in worship and they play instruments and they're just so gifted. Aren't you thankful for that? <laughs> Frankly, I'm just as thankful that some of you aren't up here doing that same thing because to be honest, that's not one of your abilities. God's given you a different set of gifts and that you're using them somewhere else. We're all given different abilities. And then this, this word P stands for personalities. 
in this room, some of you are introverts, some of you are extroverts, some of you all this, that, and the other, all the different personality tests. We're all unique. And then the E stands for experiences. And those are, by the way, I'm not just talking about positive experiences. Do you know that God can walk you through negative experiences because he wants to, to use those experiences to help you? You know, one of the negative experiences, I, I, I lost my mom to a heart attack when I was in high school. Really bad experience. But it's actually given me the ability to now think through and, and have a special level of, of empathy when somebody else loses a, a parent at a young age, especially. And, and there's also the positive experiences. Maybe you have started a business and it's been successful and God's allowing you to now use that wisdom and that experience to help other people do the same thing. You see, all of us have a unique S-H-A-P-E. God has shaped you and given you a specific set of gifts and passions and experiences and personality so that you uniquely can accomplish the purpose that he uniquely has just for you. Every single one of you was created by God with a unique shape so that you can do what only he has assigned for you to do. It says in Ephesians 2.10 again, remember I said, for we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I don't know if you've ever noticed that word anew in this verse. Here's what that means, is that without sin, the way God originally created creation, it was perfect. It was without fault. The way he designed you, uh, the way he ideally would love to be in relationship with you, there would be no sin in the picture. You were created as a masterpiece. Now, the problem is, is that sin gets in there and junks us all up. And now we start doing things, we start messing with our shape, we start focusing other places, and we're really all not that, really, we're not perfect anymore. We're not the masterpiece we were created to be, but it says that through Christ, we are created anew. We are put back into masterpiece status. And he says, listen, through Christ... Through the shape that Christ has given you, you are exactly what I need you to be to accomplish the purpose that I have for your life. And so all of us have been shaped by God. And I want you to know that that's an ongoing process. You are not right now the shape that God has ideally perfect shape that he has planned for you. Hopefully you're, you're allowing yourself to be chiseled Imagine a statue, a rock. A rock's nothing special to look at, but when a master sculptor gets up there with a chisel and a hammer and they start knocking pieces off, before you know it, you got something incredible to look at. That's what all of us should be. We should recognize that Jesus alone shapes. He's the one who created all things. He knows the exact plan he has for your life and my life. And then we basically say, all right, go ahead and mold me, shape me, form me into exactly what you want me to be, and I'll do my best to stay out of your way. Jesus alone shapes. Now, here's the third thing, is that Jesus alone sustains. Jesus alone sustains. We see this in verse 17, when it says, He, this is Jesus, existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. I want you to picture this, that he holds all creation together. I don't know if you're picturing Jesus, like literally like, all right, I'm going to keep all this from flying all over the place. So if he's literally holding it together. I don't know about you, but my, my least favorite recipes, when I open up a cookbook and I'm trying to make something new, I hate it when it says the phrase stir constantly. You know, it says, all right, put all these ingredients in and then for 20 minutes, stir constantly. Like, I don't want to stand here and do this for 20 minutes. I don't know about you. That doesn't sound fun to me. But I, I picture this idea that God is a God that not only created the world, he, he put all the recipe, the ingredients in, he created everything exactly the way he wants it. It was perfect. We're the ones who messed it up. But even still in this, in this uh, restoration process that he's made available to us, he's standing there over what he's created and he's stirring constantly. He's present. He's not sitting up in heaven on his throne, like looking down every once in a while, being like, is it boiling? Is it, you know, whatever? He's, he's watching. He's present in this room right now. He's aware 
of everything that goes on. And according to scripture, he alone sustains it all. He holds it together. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says, the sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he, this is Jesus, sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. You know, there are certain laws in this world that we live in, like laws of nature, laws of physics, laws of mathematics, laws of relativity, laws of whatever, all these different laws that kind of keep everything working the way they're supposed to. Like, we don't really know why uh, an object that has a great mass attracts things with smaller mass to it. Like the fact that right now when I jump up, I land back on the ground is because the earth has a ginormous mass and I have less than the earth. And so I, at gravity sucks me down to the ground. I don't know why that's a law. Uh, I, 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 don't, I think scientists try to like, understand the law, but they don't really kind of, where, where did this law come from, right? Or why does light always travel at the exact same speed in a vacuum? Or why does the earth spin at the exact rate that it does, at the exact orbit that it does, at the right tilt that it does? Like, who created all these systems? And now a scientist, as someone who's a naturalist, doesn't have an answer for that. They know that there's a law. But we as believers, we know that anything that, anywhere there's a law, there's also a, a lawgiver. I, I went and did some research this week for this message. And I typed into Google uh, something like, what would happen if gravity stopped? And I found an article that was written by some scientists, and it was essentially, what would happen if gravity stopped for five seconds? It's like, wow, that's going to be pretty interesting. What would happen if just gravity, if all of us just, woo? <laughs> it might be kind of cool for five seconds for gravity just to stop. And then I read that essentially uh, life would end as we know it. They explain how immediately there would be a pressure shift. All of our inner ears uh, would, would immediately erupt. Uh, that, that the earth is uh, spinning at constantly at about 1,100 uh, 1, 1, miles per hour underneath us. And if we were no longer really attached to it because of gravity, it's going to keep going. And we're now, uh, it, it's going to be pretty messy. And we're going to uh, oxygen and ch change. And, and now the earth, which is in its orbit, where it is because of the gravity of the sun is now, because there's no gravity for five seconds, the earth is now uh, finding a new uh, trajectory and it's off doing its own thing. And that's going to cause some pro Everything would, would fall apart if gravity stopped for five seconds. Probably for one second. They didn't write that article. But who holds this all together? Who created these systems that make life possible? Who, who's constantly aware of everything that's happening and is actively participating in it, the truth is that God is the lawgiver through Jesus, that Jesus alone sustains. It says in Psalm 55, verse 22, it makes it real personal. It says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. Don't you love how personal it gets right there? We're not just talking about Jesus sustaining life Jesus sustaining the earth's orbit, but he actually cares personally about you. Another way to put this is that he will help you hold it together. All right, now point number four. Before I tell you what point number four is, I'm going to show you the last three verses of our passage today and see if we can find it together. Colossians 1, verses 18 to 20. We're looking for point four. Here's what it says. Christ is also the head of the church, which is the body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Now, I don't know what S word you came up with that you're like, I think, that, I think I know where the pastor's going with this one. But here's what I have for point number four, is that Jesus alone suffices. 
Jesus alone suffices. In other words, Jesus is sufficient. You don't need to add anything to the Jesus equation to make it better. Jesus is sufficient. Let's look at the definition of this word suffice. If I open up that Webster's Dictionary, which still has the word gullible in it, it says this, to satisfy the needs or requirements of, and I love this next part, to be enough for. Jesus is enough. Jesus satisfies all the needs and requirements of becoming part of the family of God. Jesus is all that you need. When I was in college, after my, uh, about early on in my freshman year, I met my wife and we started dating. And so about half, we dated all, pretty much all of freshman year. And then we dated pretty much all of sophomore year. And by uh, th- uh, three quarters of the way through sophomore year, I already knew that Melissa was going to be my wife. I knew I wanted to marry her. She knew she wanted to marry me, or so she says. And so I I find an opportunity to sit down with her dad. And because I don't want to wait two more years, three more years, four more years to marry this girl. Like, I know she's going to be my wife. I'd rather go the next couple years, like, together with her. And so I I, I sit down with her dad. I'm only a sophomore in college at the point. We're pretty young. And I ask for his blessing to propose to Melissa. And the first time I asked that time, he said no. He said no. He said I, I, no. And then I was pretty upset about this because uh, I, I wanted to marry Melissa. So I prayed about it. I, uh, Melissa was praying about it. I asked her dad to be praying about it. I asked all of our pastors to be praying about it. And eventually he called me back and says, why don't we go out to eat again? This time I'll treat. And, and you ask me that question again. So I go out this time we actually, I was in Virginia and he was in Wilmington, Delaware. We met in Baltimore at Inner Harbor and we met at a restaurant there and I, I asked for his blessing again. He said, listen, this time you have my blessing. You can ask her to marry you, but the wedding, I'm going to put some requirements on it. You can't get married until one of you has your undergraduate degree. So I know this still means I got two years of school left. Melissa still got two years of school left. He's basically saying, you got to wait two years before you can marry my daughter. And I didn't like this idea at all. I knew I wanted to be married to her. I was going to be doing everything I could to be an honorable person who went into marriage the way God had ordained. I was going to, we were saving ourselves for marriage. I'm like, there's not, there's not a good plan to wait two years. This is not a good idea. So I immediately, I, I say to him, thank you, sir. I understand, sir. And I, I go to write to, to my professors at the college I was at. And I said, listen, my, my father-in-law says I got to wait till one of us has an undergraduate degree. How do I get two years into one? <laughs> and so we worked it out. Uh, one of them said, listen, I can independent study these two classes with you. You can take this during the summer. You can take these two clep tests. You can do this. It's going to be a lot of work next year. You're going to have to have a really full load. But if you want to, we can make this happen. And I said, I want to. Let's make it happen. All right, so I have this plan. I call up my father-in-law and I say, hey, good news. He did, not, <laughs> he did not think it was good news, but, but I did it. I graduated in three years. We got married that summer. But here's, here's the idea. Like there, were, there was a, a, a list of requirements, right? When you go to college, there's a degree completion plan. These are the courses you have to take to get the degree that you want to walk across the stage and move the tassel. You got to do these first. And so I knew I had to get all those things done. And I was given the freedom to kind of get it done in three years. Some people, right, do it in four or five or seven or whatever. But I'm like, I want to get it done. You know how crazy it would be, though, if I walk up to my guidance counselor, my guidance counselor had said, listen, you've met all the requirements. What you've done suffices for a undergraduate degree. And I said, you know what? I don't think that's right. I feel like I should take six more classes before I walk across the stage. People would look at me like I was crazy, right? Why would you do that? Because at the end of the day, there's a, there's a list of requirements. And once you check all those boxes, you've met the, you, you, you met the you, sufficient standards to walk across the stage and graduate. In my case, to graduate and get married. But here's what Paul's saying to the church in Colossae. There's only one box to check. 
Jesus suffices. All you need to enter into this relationship with God is Jesus. It's not Jesus plus an undergraduate degree. It's not Jesus plus the law. It's not Jesus plus this or Jesus plus that. It's just Jesus, the degree completion plan, to be part of the family of Christ, to walk across the stage and say, I'm now a part of the family of Christ. It's putting your faith in Jesus. That's it. I want to point out one other truth before I close. Is that in Scripture, in this passage of Scripture, it says that Jesus is the head of the church. Now, I want you to think about that, that phraseology for just a moment. First, I want you to know that the church is not a man-made idea. This is not some idea that somebody came up with saying, hey, let's start a club and every Christian gets together once a week. No, this is something that God created through Jesus, Jesus uh, c- created this thing called the church. And he says, listen, I want you to not forsake gathering together as a church and being a part of this commission I'm giving to you. But then we also learn that Jesus is the head of the church. If you have uh, the stomach for it, you can go onto YouTube and search for a video called Chicken with its Head Cut Off. You'll see what happens when you cut the head off of a chicken. I assume that you cut the head off the chicken and then you just have a dead chicken. But no, that thing runs around for like a minute with no head. Its wings are flapping and it's going crazy. It's running in circles. It's obviously not making any noise because its head's gone, but it's doing all that, right? It's, it's going all over. It's going like crazy. And the truth is that there's a lot of churches in our world right now, in our community, in our country that do not have Jesus as the head. They've decided that they got to have other things. We got to do this. We got to treat people. We got to think this. We got to say this. And they got a bunch of other things. Jesus is no longer sufficient as the head of their church. And so they're running around with every wind of doctrine and every wind of teaching doing whatever they can. They're flopping around like crazy until they eventually die. But a Rundle Christian church is a church where we recognize that Jesus suffices and he's the head of this church. If he tells the church to do something, we do it. If he says jump, we say how high. If he says don't do something, we don't do it. Because Jesus is the head of this church. All right now, with, with these four things, I want you to ask this prayer. Wherever you are right now, I want you to, to ask the Holy Spirit inside of you right now. Simply put, what now, God? What do you want me to do with this? I want to paint a, a little word picture for you real quick. Of uh, uh, Here's another fun YouTube video. It's a YouTube video called How to Catch a Baboon. And essentially you watch as this, this man, he cuts a hole in this rock about the, the size of a baboon's hand. And inside the hole puts a bigger hole and inside that hole puts some food that a baboon would like to eat and the baboon goes up to the hole curious and puts his arm inside the hole and he grabs onto the thing that he wants and now because the baboon's fist is like this he can't get his arm out and he sits there yanking and trying to get his arm out of the hole but he can't and as this man is coming by to catch the baboon the baboon is now freaking out that he's stuck, not realizing that all he has to do is let go of the thing in his hand and he can run off, but he won't do it. So he sits there holding on to the thing that's eventually going to get him killed and captured. So the man comes over and captures the baboon. See, a lot of us, that's how we go through life. We find a, a hole that looks enticing And we want whatever's inside there. And so we put our hand in there, not realizing that because we're unwilling to let go of our grip on whatever that thing is, that's ultimately going to be our downfall. We're letting ourselves be caught up and captured by this world. When simply put, what we ought to do is say, Jesus, I don't need whatever's in my hand. You alone save. You alone shape. You alone sustain. You alone suffice. I'm going to let go. Pull my arm out. Maybe what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do today is to let Jesus save you. To 
If you're in this room and you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you want to fix that today, would you just come find me after service and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be saved by the only person who can save me. Maybe what the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart is to let Jesus shape you, to stand before his chisel and his hammer, to be like soft clay and let Jesus mold you and and shape you into who he wants you to be. What is it that you have to give up and get rid of to become who God's calling you to be? Maybe the Holy Spirit's telling you that he can sustain you. Maybe you've got a burden that's too heavy right now, something that's been hanging over your head. And simply put, the Holy Spirit is just asking you to, to hand it over to God. Let him be the trustworthy God that he is and sustain you. Maybe Jesus is asking you to, to let him be sufficient for you to drop everything else that you think you need so that he can be enough. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this letter from Paul to the church in Colossae. Thank you for this initial opening of this, of this her- heretical belief that, that they had, that they had to add something to you to make the equation work. We recognize as a church that you alone save us. You alone were the creator of all things that shapes us. God, we recognize that you alone are the one that sustains all things, including our own lives. And God, you are sufficient. We don't need anything but you. And so we thank you for that truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.